Finally tonight, it's time to get story ended. She's a New York Times best-selling children's author. She's here tonight to talk about writing, telling great stories, and her latest work, Grump, the fairly true tale of Snow White and the Seven Dwarves. Joining me now from Chicago is Liesl Shirtliff. Liesl, thanks for being here. Thanks so much for having me. Now, now, Grump is your fourth foray into classic fairy tales. You kind of turn them on their ears a little bit. What drew you to mining these classic fairy tales? This is not the first book you've written in this series. Uh, no, it's, it's the fourth. And um, fairy tales have always been a part of my childhood. Um, I was always really drawn to them as a child. My grandmother actually gave me my first copy of Grimm's Fairy Tales, and I just devoured those stories. Mm. And when I grew up and I started writing, I really hadn't intended to write fairy tales at first, but um, I think I just kind of kept coming back to them. And um, I think my subconscious kind of led me back to them, knowing that that was really where I had a lot of um, creativity to mm. mine. So um, it's just something that I've always been really passionate about. Before I get deeply into the book, you dedicate uh, Grump to your seven siblings, which is appropriate. This is, after all, the seven dwarves <laughs> and Snow White. Do you use your family as archetypes for your characters? I use them for uh, bits and pieces of them and their personalities um, as for characters and even situations and dialogue. Um, I, I'm, I hesitate to say, you know, this sibling is this character and <laughs> that sibling is that character. Um, oh, I'm sure they because, can tell. Because, you know, who knows how they're going to feel about that. <laughs> <laughs> they, might, they might be able to tell um, a little bit, but I, I, never, I never make it too specific, or at um, least I never admit. <laughs> yeah, that's smart. You see, never tell them, Lisa, never tell them. Even I, I've gotten a few calls about characters, and I go, oh, no, there's no relation at all to you. I just move on. Um, why Grumpy? Why hitch <laughs> an entire book on Grumpy and that particular uh, dwarf? And where did the name Borland comes fr come from, which you reveal as his true name in this book? Well, Borlin is actually a character, and the origin of the story comes from my last book, Red, right. the fairly true tale of Red Riding Hood. Um, she meets this dwarf named Borlin. He is rather grumpy. Um, and in the course of conversation, Snow White comes up, and he calls Snow White a spoiled brat. Oh. And um, it kind of took me off guard as I, as I wrote that. It was kind of like this, this character took over, and... Um, and I started to wonder what this tale would look like from a dwarf's point of view. They're mm -hmm. kind of a more marginalized, um, <laughs> you know, characters that are just kind of set to the side, and we don't we don't get a whole lot from them. Mm -hmm. Now, Grumpy in particular, that's um, that's a Disney character. That's, that's a licensed right. character. Um, it, he's not, you know, he's not, tech, he's not that character. Mm -hmm. um, I make a nod to that because that's what everyone knows. Kids are reading right. this story, and when they think of Snow White and the Seven Dwarves, they think of the Disney story. Right. Um, but actually, in the original Grimm's version, they don't have names at all. They're just referred to as first, second, third, fourth. Um, right. Just numbers and generic and, elf number four. You know, as a collective. <laughs> You. Exactly. So I really wanted, you know, and I think Disney kind of took that a step further and they, they individualized them a little bit, but mm -hmm. I wanted to even take it further and, and really give them names and histories and backgrounds and, um, you know, just give them a little bit more, more dignity. Yeah, well, you, we, we really discovered that there's an entire world that these dwarves occupy that you really don't think about. And here you've, I mean, they're chomping on rubies, and, and, um, and I love the way that you've kind of cross-pollinated <laughs> all these books. And my daughter's Red Red and, and Jack. Um, and what you've done is they are standalone tales, but there is some cross-pollination. As you mentioned, this character appeared in Red, and, and Jack and Red have a, have a connection. Tell me about that um, network, if you will, of characters. Was that something premeditated or something you stumbled on as you wrote one story and the next? I have to admit, it's something I more stumbled upon, but I think it actually comes about really naturally with fairy tales mm -hmm. because they share so many common themes and threads between the stories themselves. Um, 
you know, even in the original Snow White tale, there's a there's a there's a spot that actually connects with Goldilocks, mm -hmm. and um, you know, uh, there's lots of themes of gold and treasure in these stories. Um, princesses and towers are asleep, so there's just a lot of crossover between the fairy tales themselves, anyway. So as I was writing them, I would find those little um, connections. And when I found them, I would kind of milk them for all they were worth and um, it just had a lot of fun doing it. But I, mm -hmm. I always allowed it to come about naturally um, and, and never wanted it to be forced, the connection between the stories. So it, it was all very organic for what sure. What do you want kids and their parents to come away with from this particular uh, book, the fourth book in this series, Grump? Uh, I think first and foremost, when, whenever I'm writing a story for children, I just really hope that the kids first will want to read it, that they'll find it to be a really enjoyable book that mm -hmm. um, shows them that reading can be really fun and not a chore. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of uh, overall message uh, or lessons, I, I don't think about that too hard while I'm, mm -hmm. while I'm writing, but... Um, I do hope that they they think about point of view, um, that changing the point of view of anyone's story changes the story, and yeah. and you get you know different lessons and and different things from that. And also, these fairy tales are awesome stories, and um, there's there's just a lot to mine there. And and I hope that they'll look at the original fairy tales as well, and and kind of compare and contrast. Mm -hmm. So it's really fun to see how they've changed over time. Yeah, and I love how you've slotted these stories. They're almost extra canonical. They fit within the flow of the other stories, but kind of fill in the blanks and and enlarge them a bit around the edges and humanize these characters in a way we haven't seen before. So I, I know I've seen kids respond particularly to the series. So I know it. I know it works. Now you study music and dance and theater at Brigham Young University. How did that shape your writing life? Oh, it shaped my writing life hugely. Um, some people say, oh, do you, do you feel like you wish you would have majored in writing or, you know, creative writing or something? And um, I really feel like theater, especially for children's writing, was the perfect uh, way to um, study story and character arc, um, character objective. In my acting classes, we were mm -hmm. constantly, you know, being hounded about what is it that your character wants? You have to know, you have to know, mm -hmm. and, and that's really going to shape the character development and how the scene feels. And so I'm constantly thinking about that in my writing as well. What is it that my character wants? How are they going mm -hmm. to get it? Um, what's working against them? So the same kinds of principles really apply. And um, I also feel like, um, you know, musicals, I feel like that form has sort of informed my writing as well, mm. that they kind of have a, a cheesy kind of musical theater quality that I think works great for fairy tales yeah. and great for kids. No, they're fun. They're fun. Now, tell me, you wrote in a blog entry uh, once, and I'm going to pull this on you here. Uh, it was called A Fear and Faith, and you said your faith is something that deeply affects your writing in process and content. What does that mean? Yeah, well, I think um, I often hear a lot of people say that they they really want to write a book, that they have all these ideas, mm -hmm. um, which to me means that they have really good intention but no drive to actually put it into practice. And um, I think that can really uh, go back to um, faith, religious practice, and belief. Uh, we can believe things, but if we don't actually put those beliefs into practice, what good are they? And I kind of feel the same way about creativity and ideas. If you have lots of creative ideas and they're constantly spinning in your head, that's great. But if you don't do anything with them, then they're not, they're not benefiting anyone else and they're not benefiting you. So, um, and, and honestly, I think when we're, um, we're writing, it's, um, it, is, it is a process of faith. You don't always know how things are going to turn out. You have this idea and you really like it and you have hope that it will be something good, but you don't know what it's going to look like, look, look like in the end. And so um, to me, any creative process is an act of faith. A walk of faith, yeah, absolutely. Uh, okay, I have to ask you some questions that I ask every author who sits on this particular segment. Your favorite children's book is what and why? 
My favorite children's book, it's really hard to pick just one, but I'm going to go with Matilda by oh. Roald Dahl. And he's, a, he's an author that has hugely affected my writing, and he, and he really affected my childhood as a reader, mm. especially that book, Matilda. When I read that book, it really inspired me to be a reader. I, as I read it, uh, I started to really believe that reading was a powerful thing and that it could change us and it could, mm. it could change um, the way that we think and, mm. um, and how we think about ourselves. So I, mm. I love Matilda. That's a beautiful book. Now, I've read it to my daughter several times. I love Roald Dahl. I love that you said that. Uh, his adult writing, by the way, is also a oh, little more racy, but great. Uh, your least favorite children's <laughs> book or book and why? Uh, yeah, I... Um, I'm not going to say a. I'm not going to say a children's book. Okay, <laughs> that's okay. Um, I yeah, but but can I say a book that I did not I did not particularly care for? Yes. Is that okay? Yes. Um, so, I I did not love Wuthering Heights. Oh. Um, that book just yeah I just did not care for it, which is interesting because. I really loved um, Jane Eyre. Uh, uh -huh. It's actually one of my favorite books. Wow. But, you know, Wuthering Heights just. No. Heathcliff didn't do it for you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Which story helped you to find your own path and the one life lesson that you remember from it? Oh, which story helped me find my own path and the <laughs> life lesson? Um, I, don't, I don't necessarily know about about path so much, but something mm -hmm. that, a book that altered my point of view, my way of thinking, um, is The Lemon Tree by oh. Sandy Tolan. Huh. Um, and it's, it's a non-fiction book. This is not children's. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but I recommend it to all adults. And it's a book about um, the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. Huh. And he really takes it to a very human level of an Arab woman, an Arab man, and a Jewish woman, mm. and a very unlikely friendship that they form. And um, talking and discussing the conflict there, and it gives a lot of history, mm -hmm. and it really, really changed um, the way I feel about. Well, first it just informed me. I really did not know very much about that conflict, at least mm -hmm. the history. And it just really um, brought more understanding. And I think um, that let me know how important it is to, to study history mm. and to, um, to, to get also a personal story about uh, whatever is, has gone on or is going on. I think personal stories, telling stories, telling our story, mm -hmm. and then listening to other people's story is so so important so all storytelling whether it's um whether it's fiction or nonfiction, i think is a really powerful thing i agree where do you write liesel and why <laughs> i write anywhere that i know i'm not going to be interrupted <laughs> <laughs> and that's moderately quiet <laughs> um you know that i have four children and um, that can be kind of chaotic sometimes. So um, I'm often leaving the house, and I will I will write in my church building actually sometimes, mm -hmm. and um, or, or I'll go to a cafe and and mm -hmm. write in a cafe because I know no one's gonna interrupt me there and huh. um, you know ask me to brush their teeth or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Or help them with the homework. Um, I, I, I'm a big fan of cafes, too. They're not a big fan of me, but I, but I, I frequent those. If you could pick a writing mentor. <laughs> I, I, try to, I try to order something. Yeah, well, that's good. Me, too. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not in for that new Starbucks policy where you can go in but not order anything. If you could pick a writing mentor, dead or alive, who would it be? Um, Charles Dickens. Ah, the great I, Charles I think Dickens. he's just brilliant. Uh, he... He creates the most incredible characters. Him or, or Lewis Carroll, because <laughs> yeah. he's just wacky. Yeah, he is wacky. <laughs> but, and his characters are memorable in their own way, but not, they're not Dickens. Advice to parents who want to get their children to read, particularly to reluctant readers, what would you say to them? Well, first I would say read to them. And I really think that's the gateway to becoming a reader is to be read to. And that was really... Um, that was the beginning for me. My mom read to me. My I loved the read aloud at school. That was mm. 
It's just so wonderful. Get them to fall in love with stories. Um, and, and then read with them as they read, as they grow in their reading, continue, you know, take turns. And so make it a slow process. I think that sometimes um, we're so eager to make our children independent readers that as soon as they can read, we're like, okay, now you're on your own. Um, but this, it, it should be a bonding time for a long time. And I read, you know, I still read to my kids, even though they're all, all but the baby. Mm. They're all uh, very independent readers, but we still enjoy reading together. And so yeah. um, I think if you make that a part, of, a part of your family and a part of your life, that they'll become readers themselves. Oh, also, just give them, um, give them a lot of choice. Mm -hmm. You know, they're not, they're not going to, um, they're not all going to love the same books and they might not love the books that you love, uh, but that's okay. Mm -hmm. I think just giving them a lot of choice is really key yeah. to becoming yeah. a reader. There's nothing like a family sharing a story. That's why I love audio books as well as when they read to one another because then they can discuss the stumbling blocks, the challenges, the confusions, and the, and the, the bursts of light that happen while they're encountering that story. I agree with you. Final question. Game of Thrones author George Martin always says authors are either architects or gardeners. Which are you, Liesl? I'm a gardener. A gardener. <laughs> what does that mean to you? I'm not sure what that means exactly, but it, it, it seems to resonate. Um, be, <laughs> I, I think of stories as things that are grown, you know, and mm -hmm. I, I start with a very small seed, and I, again, I don't know exactly how it's going to turn out. I don't mm -hmm. have... I don't have a grand plan usually beforehand. I just have this, this little tiny idea that keeps pulsing and keeps growing, and I just, and then I'm planting more seeds and more seeds, and some of them turn into little flowers, and some of them turn into trees. So mm -hmm. that that seems to that idea seems to resonate mm -hmm. more with me than than an art being an architect. That sounds. Much yeah, too rigid really, and controlling. Um, yeah, I, well, I agree with difficult. you. We're, I, I like to think we're yeah, a little bit Yeah, yeah, that's, you know? that's the word. But uh, thank you so much, Liesl, for being here. And the book is Grump, the fairly true tale of Snow White and the Seven Dwarves by Liesl Shirtliff. It's available at bookstores everywhere and online. You middle grade readers will love it. Liesl, thanks. We'll see you again soon. Thank you so much, Raymond.